firstly, thank you so much, so much indeed to the IOSH branch here for inviting me in to speak and deliver this presentation this evening. It was a real pleasure, uh, something I very much enjoy. And, uh, and you'll probably guess through this presentation is a real passion of mine. Okay, so in terms of introductions, my name is Vince, Vince Donovan. I'm one of the directors of a company based in Cardiff called Safety Solutions. And the subject that I'm going to cover for you tonight is on the subject of violence and aggression. Uh, and from an IASH perspective, and I'm guessing we'll have many health and safety managers present and uh, hopefully in attendance, do we really know the levels of risk that our staff encounter when they go about their jobs? Are our staff actually reporting when they suffer incidents of abuse, threats, assaults, or any form of harassment in the workplace? Or sometimes do they fail to report? Sorry, I just heard some background in the background, but uh, yeah, so if, guys, if you're going to mute yourselves, it'd be great, great if that's okay. So that's the subject there is I'm going to cover. Um, in terms of my experience in this subject area, I work with, I deliver training to, I probably work with about 350 organizations over the past 20 years. And these are a number of local authorities and housing associations and various national charities you can see. My personal background, I served 30 years as a police officer in Cardiff. I started, as a, started off as a Bobby on the Beat, which I loved and uh, part of community work, going into day centres and youth clubs and whatever. But my roles changed. CID, drug squad, vice squad, part of the firearms team, part of a riot response team. But then I specialised in areas of counter-terrorism, community safety, crime prevention. And, and these, these little avenues opened up different doorways to engage in with different organisations. And then when I finished my 30 years in 2014, this has given me scope then to focus entirely into delivering training. So prior to COVID, I was traveling all around the country. And now I very quickly realized that you had to try a damn sight harder to make an impression with regard to virtual training. So I'm hoping when you see this presentation, you'll see some of my attempts to engage better within a training environment. And these are some of the things I actually use on a day-to-day -day basis. Today, I was training staff within a homeless charity and I'll go through some of these issues. Okay, so in terms of the overview of the presentation, we're gonna look at employer responsibilities to manage and identify risk. We're gonna look at what those risks are with regard to violence and aggression towards staff. And do we really know? We're going to look at those employee responsibilities to report certain concerns and incidents of that like. And then lastly, the types of risks that lone workers and indeed those members of staff who offer support in a variety of different roles can sometimes or sometimes reasonably encounter. Let's move on. Let's firstly look at employee responsibilities under the Health and Safety at Work Act. As we know, the umbrella aspect of this, but how do we manage risk? What are the risks? Do we have a a strong understanding of the type of risks that our staff experience. Have we set up management and uh, safety committees? Do we ask employers to give feedback in terms of their concerns? And these should reg regularly occur as we go through our operations and conducting our businesses. And certain things have to be reported with regard to RIDA related issues. And I'm not gonna go into and dwell much on this, but these are some of the roles and responsibilities of organizations and also to provide that information, instruction, training and supervision for their staff. Let's move on. The types of risks that can reasonably occur when doing our job are far more than these, but I'm looking at potentially trips, slips and falls. For some staff, some staff is dog bites. Uh, some staff as lone workers will open up and lock up at the end of the day. So I was training staff recently who worked in a show home environment. And on a Saturday, members of staff would then open up, deactivate the alarm, and be there all day and not have a clue would suddenly turn up. And what if things got difficult? Okay, so, so those staff, the risk of medical-related issues if staff are unwell, and the increased risk if staff are working independently without close or direct supervision. Anxiety and stress for those members of staff who are lone working, who are home working at this current time. And for me, our subject matter, one with regard to violence and aggression, violence and aggression in the workplace. Firstly, I just want to identify and have some clarity regarding lone workers and the types of roles that some people engage in that lone worker type environment. So those individuals who work at a fixed base, 
at a betting shop, but uh, at, a, at a petrol station, independently, working alone without any supervision. Those staff who work separately from other people on the same premises or sometimes outside of normal working hours. We've got various examples here. Home working. How many staff are currently remote working, working at home and juggling those life related issues, family situations as well? I, I've worked with some clients that sometimes when they're dealing with their, their service users and those service users have their own anxiety and sometimes their own mental health issues, they're shouting, they're swearing at those members of staff that the poor staff have got to go out in the garden and continue that phone call when providing support whilst currently working at home. So things have been particularly difficult, certainly over the last 11, almost 12 months now. Working away from a fixed space, lone workers again, and, and these being examples, staff with enforcement roles and the additional risk that, that they can encounter. Um, and those hazards related to loan working as well, with regard to using electrical items of that nature. Uh, those involved in transportation, again, working alone. And my focus a bit later on will be with regard to those individuals who, as a direct result of the nature of their work, were a knock on a door, say hello, and then go in and provide direct support. That element and the risks associated with that area of work. And of course, it's not just employees, it's volunteers. It's those volunteers who support our organisations. We've got a duty of care to, to provide that information, instruction, supervision and training for those individuals who represent us and our best interests. And of course, nowadays we have the gig economy. And it was interesting with the recent decisions uh, with the court, the judicial, sorry, the judicial processes uh, regarding um, the, the taxi company uh, that's affected people in London. So with regard to the gig economy, in essence, apparently, and I guess these figures relate prior to COVID because the thing is, it's probably a lot more than that, but 46% of the UK workforce consider themselves as lone workers. And without that direct support, sometimes they are at an increased risk of one of workplace violence and aggression. But what are the numbers? What do the numbers actually tell us? In terms of violence and aggression, the latest figures, 2020, that they're recorded by the Health and Safety Executive, suggest that between the years 2019 and 2020, they were just under, well, not too far under, 700,000 incidents reported. Of those incidents, and this is England and Wales, of those England uh, incidents, there were 389,000 threats recorded. 299,000 assaults. And I did a bit of maths here, and just with regard to on a yearly basis, that equates to just under 2,000 incidents of violence and aggression occurring. And that's only the ones that are reported, because I'm telling you now, there are so many that go unreported, and I'll give you some reasons why. Let's look at our organization's responsibilities to carry out risk assessments. This is one of my, my clients here, a local authority. And what are the risks of staff? And how do we identify them? Who can be affected and how? And what measures are need to be introduced? How can we bring a high risk down to a more manageable risk? And what are those, what are those outcomes? And are staff trained in all those type of aspects there? How we manage risk? How we report incidents? Our safety representatives? and instruction, as I mentioned. So what are our employee responsibilities? Firstly, do our employees know that they do have duties to report certain incidents? They have to report accidents, injuries, near misses, and those dangerous occurrences. But what I'm gonna go into in more specifically is the actual health and safety executive's definition of work-related violence, which states, and I'm gonna come back to this definition perhaps one or uh, once or twice, that as an, as an employee, as an employee work for an organization of five or more, it is their duty to report any incident in which either they're abused, threatened, or indeed assaulted in circumstances relating to their work. I'm gonna cover abuse, threats, and assaults now shortly, but let's go into the last part, in circumstances relating to their work. Now, there are some clients of mine, and they may work in projects supporting extremely vulnerable people with lots going on in their lives, and they may be off on their day off and with their family, and it, 
say things were particularly difficult in the week and say that member staff was responsible for reporting somebody and that person was then subsequently ev evicted from that particular project. And if that member staff is out with their family and then that individual sees them because they live in the same area, comes up to them in the street, and either abuses, threatens or assault them, is that a reportable incident? Yes, it is, because it's a circumstance related to the work. It wouldn't have happened but for the workplace. And what I try to make clear to staff that sometimes now with digital security now and online harassment, a member of staff could take a phone call from a colleague. And I work with social workers and social workers have told me they've had a phone call and, and they, they've been told, click on this link. And by clicking on that link, they then realize that somebody has video recorded them and they've uploaded it to YouTube. And some of the comments about what I would do to this individual are, are extremely threatening, hostile, very harassing in nature. This, even though that member of staff has taken a phone call, a phone call from a colleague of those, of those and is watching a television at 7.30 at night, is that a circumstance related to their work? If it's work-related, yes, it is. Do our employees know that? Do they know they have a duty to report that? So as an organization, we can identify that risk. We can look to provide the appropriate support, support for that member of staff and where necessary, take action against those responsible. The roles, responsibilities of employers there. So what is a reportable incident? What is abuse? What do we mean by that? How many, even though the crime figures do not actually record abuse, there's not many abuse records anyway, in reality, because for many staff, they think it's part of the job. The times I've heard, oh, tell you what, if I had time to, if I had time to report every time I was abused, I wouldn't be able to get the job done. There are other reasons why staff don't report abuse. Sometimes they may have said the, the wrong thing and because they've acted inappropriately, that they may have wound up or created that situation. Sometimes staff don't even know where the forms are. They've never been told. They're oblivious to that. That's another reason why sometimes staff don't record incidents. But when we look at the nature of abuse, what does abuse mean? And this is all about personal, personal stuff. If they have got a working relationship with a client and that person says something so insulting, so offensive, so, so, so derogatory about that individual personally, that that relationship with that individual now has been tainted in some way, that perhaps that member of staff is not safe being on their own with that person because it might actually escalate and where particular reference is made to the protective characteristics, if that person says something to a member of staff which is either sexist, racist, homophobic, and others that makes that member of staff feel upset and offended, then that is a reason where a member of staff needs to report they've suffered verbal abuse in the workplace. Let's go further. Sometimes a service user may disclose or share or make a statement to a member of staff which is not actually about them, it's about their colleague. Is that reportable? Yes, it is. They've got a duty of care to their colleague. If that person says something so offensive, their colleague needs to know, and that member of staff needs to escalate that and write it down appropriately. If they simply ring their manager and say, oh, well, just so you know, I felt a bit uncomfortable. So-and-so said this about, uh, about John earlier, I'm really worried. That to me, and when I explain that on training, that frankly is gossip. A phone call, telling somebody in a corridor, telling somebody in a meeting is gossip. Unless it's written down, it hasn't happened. It's not recorded. There's no audit trail. We can't action that. And many organizations re require that audit trail when they look to take action, which could lead to evictions of their housing associations or other action in other environments. Abused. If we look at the subject of threats, Staff get threatened. Do you know, at the start of every training session, I ask staff and I literally go over to this whiteboard at the back here. And, and I'd say, tell me what type of risk or concerns you can reasonably encounter in the workplace. The fact that they get threatened. I know where you live. I know your kids go to school. I know what car you drive. I'm going to kill you. Some of our employees are suffering this level of threats. And do they report it? Sometimes they're embarrassed. Sometimes they don't know where the forms are. Sometimes they think it's part of the job. As health and safety managers, we should be educating our staff so that they know where these are and they are appropriately supported. So what are we looking at regarding threats? A direct threat against this person, the person themselves, their property. These are crimes as well. 
or a colleague. It could also be somebody from a third party organization as well. Last week, I did a little bit of training session and a housing officer went to speak to one of their clients. To a, it was a regarding an antisocial behavior issue. The member of staff spoke to that person because that person got agitated. He didn't like being spoken to by uh, the member of staff. He threatened the member of staff on the doorstep. The member of staff felt uncomfortable. She turned her back, she walked, she made herself, made her way over to the car which, which was parked nearby. He carried on threatening her uh, and saying all various comments, shouted through the door, and with that, then she heard footsteps running. She turned, she saw this guy running after. She ran as fast as she could to the car. She, she activated her communication device. She continues running to the car. She managed to open the door, flustered, open the door. She got in the car, she starts the engine. The guy gets alongside the car. He tries to open the door, he can't get in. He jumped up on the bonnet of that car and he's now banging the windscreen, threatening, trying to, well, I don't know. She activated her order, uh, a communication device. What we're looking at there is not a direct threat, but an actual threatening experience, an encounter, a situation. That would need to be reported. That needs to be recorded in itself. The other areas in that definition, we look at assaults. It's not right for a member of staff to get assaulted. Well, what is an assault? An assault can vary because now we've got crossovers between health and safety legislation and criminal legislation. And when we look at an assault, it could well be that that individual gets so angry, so aggressive, they then start pointing at a member of staff. I'm sorry about this, guys. This is zooming in on your screen <laughs> a lot bigger now. They start pointing and possibly start poking that person. That's an assault. That's a common assault. If that person pushes that person, it's a common assault. It's a slap across the face. It's a barge in the shoulder. If it's a trip, if it was done out of anger and frustration, it's an assault in law, a common assault. And there are more severe injuries, actual bodily harm, grievous bodily harm, grievous bodily harm with intent or without intent. And these are the subject areas I look to educate staff on training, okay? Any member of staff, when you do your work, nobody has a right to place hands on you. And sometimes yet staff get a little bit confused. They say that I was, oh, I'll tell you what, I, I was verbally assaulted. Verbally assaulted? Verbally assaulted doesn't exist. Verbal abuse, verbal abuse, verbal is words. Assault is physical, physical actions. So we need to get our language right and our staff need to know what's expected of them. And not only, not only assault out of aggression, but what if it's an assault out of, what if it's a sexual assault? And what's the role of management in terms of investigating this? And what we're looking at, so you, you might look at that picture and think, is that a sexual assault? The guy has placed his hand on this lady's shoulder. Is, is that a sexual assault? It's all down to the perception of the victim. If the victim thought it was, it is. It's not for a manager to say, oh, do you know, I, I, don't, think that was a, I don't think that was a sexual assault. It's the victim's decision. If the victim felt that that person gave him the creeps, that they were trying to touch their bra strap, for example, if it was a grope, it was a pinch, it was a grab. If it's done from a sexual perspective, it's a sexual assault. It's another crime, abuse, hate crime, threats, a crime, assaults, a crime. And not only should we be recorded from an employee perspective, but we should be encouraging our or supporting our staff if they wish to escalate it and they wish to take action from a legal criminal perspective as well, because all these are crimes. And it's not only that, it's harassment too. Sometimes some of my colleagues, my, my clients, the, the organizations I work for, they provide a great deal of support. They sit down, they listen to people. And for the first time for some of my, my vulnerable, vulnerable sort of service users, that's, you know, that's, that's quite something. And then some of those individuals get very, very needy and, um, and they get friendly. And then you've got issues regarding professional boundaries. They, they want to be your Facebook friend and uh, they want to find out about you. And with regard to the offence of harassment, then that friendship or that obsession or out of a grudge, but back to an obsession, could link towards stalking. So harassment is a crime. And when a member of staff, and it does happen, when a member of staff feels so scared or frightened and going to work because of what they're experiencing, or oh, this person has followed them home, has turned up outside their house, and I get these get shared to me. 
On one occasion, a lady was working in the library. This guy would go into the library at nine o'clock in the morning, stay there all through the day till five, follow her to her car, and every day, Monday to Friday, do that. What really spooked her is when he turned up and he started looking through her window and she lived 10 miles away from the library. Harassment, harassment is a crime. As I mentioned nowadays, not only harassment can occur in person, but it can occur in the online world as well. And I've worked with so many staff who found that they've actually been, that the service user has deliberately videoed them. They put a camera in their face. Member staff gets really frightened and concerned about that. They check on YouTube and they find that they've been recorded, it's been uploaded. And I talk about the circumstances relating to that. Okay, online harassment, violence and aggression in the workplace. So many organizations will have a multi purpose accident incident near miss form, and that's fine. But what I try to encourage organizations to have is a specific, as a specific incident with regard to violence and aggression. And this is a good example. So here we've got nature of incident, verbal abuse, racial, threatening posture, physical assault, criminal damage, severe verbal abuse, sexual threats with a weapon, serious physical assault, attempted theft. So we're prioritizing and giving guidance to our employees to tick and give these indications so we can investigate further. So yeah, have a generic one. But sometimes I like the idea of having a specific one for workplace violence aggression, so we can actually capture and have an accurate record of the risks our staff are encountering. And for me, many, many years ago, 20 years I've been doing this, the last six years, pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis, even now, this is about, I've probably delivered about 150 presentations using Zoom, using Teams to clients all around the country since March of last year. So, so I, I've tried to make this more visual, more impacted. But many, many years ago, uh, I was working with the health authority and I really like this and I share this. And this is really useful. When we look to manage risk, can we honestly say that in the last 12 months, that, that for example, with office staff, reception, support, but outreach staff, we had two members of staff were assaulted in the last 12 months, but, and then one lone worker. So we had three assaults. With regard to threatening behaviour, we had some of our support staff again and outreach staff and, and law workers. In other words, assaults, threatening behaviour, verbal abuse, inappropriate comments or gestures, allegations, harassment or bullying. Do we know in the last 12 months, can we put a figure on it, how many of our staff suffered workplace violence and aggression? Or is it all on Excel spreadsheets? We haven't got an idea, we haven't got a clue. And then when we have this data, can we review it? Can we look at, say, 2020, and then when we get to the end of 2021, say, well, actually, we've done well here because we've reduced it. Although we've educated our staff and they now know what to report, actually, our reports have actually reduced. That's really good. Our loan workers feel safer. We've introduced safe systems of work, and that's where we need to be. Okay. I want to mention, firstly, around some of those higher-risk roles that staff can encounter. I'm going to focus firstly on home visits and a nice way that I use to sort of navigate that to improve staff safety. And then we're going to look at those staff who invariably work in projects, um, supporting people in a variety of different ways and some of the risks they can encounter. So let's look firstly at how I deliver sessions on home visits for those staff who knock on a door, but obviously now in COVID would see us change that. And I use this as a little sort of navigation tool for me. Firstly, what information do we know about that person? Are they flagged up? Should I be going there on my own? As a male member of staff, should I be going alone or not? So we'll look at that some, uh, shortly. Where is it? Before I've even left the office, where am I going? Am I, am I clear? Do I know where it is? Can I park there? Um, who knows I'm going? Have I, have I updated the calendar? Have I got a buddy in system? Have I got a communication device? What if it goes wrong? What's my emergency procedure? What, what, how do I comply with my policies and procedures regarding the emergency response? Okay, then I set, I set off, I go. I'm driving, I park up, I walk to the location, I knock on the door. And that's my little sort of audit trail of how I deliver a session on loan working personal safety. What do I know about the individual? What, what facility, what, what does my computer system tell me when I search that particular person, the address, or nearby? Are there anything I should be aware of? 
I think this is a really great example. I will say their name, Titarian. It's a housing association covering the South Wales area. And I really like this because they've got something very, very visual. They've got a traffic light system, red, orange, green. Red, joint visits. Red, no staff visits. OK, we've got green and oranges there. But also, same with red, potentially violent person or property. No female, no male on working. That's important. It needs to be clear. It might be that that member of staff needs to ring somebody to find out further information, possibly. But at least we've got clear structures and guidance. And the requirement being that staff will check that database to see what current information is known in the interest of their safety. And that is then um, that comes up in supervision and, uh, and instruction going forward regarding the location where they're going. OK, so I picked up a map on Google Maps. I put Chilton right in the center there. But then using Google Street View, going up the little, the little person there and then going into the street itself. Right, so I'm going to number 23 Wilson Road. I now know what it looks like. Do you know, I don't really like the luck of that. There's a guy sat on the wall with a bottle of beer. Look at all those green bags with all bottles of beers and cans in there. I'm going into that house. And the good thing on this, and I think I find the value on this, certainly in training, if I go back into that, is that when we look at uh, Google Street View, it may be a bit blurry on your screen, but I can see on here, image capture June 2018. So the GIS gives us an indication on how up to date that, that photograph is when we go into Street View. That could be really helpful, really useful to a low member of staff who's going there for the first time. Where are they going to park? Do they want to park outside the house or perhaps not? Okay, so what are our communication responses before I've left? Many organizations nowadays, and I'm really pleased and thrilled to see this because in the old days, goodness me, they'd have a whiteboard out in useless, all right? And that's what it was, even if they remember to say they were out, because that seldom happened. But now with the likes of Outlook 365, staff are able to put their visits, the times, and what I really like it about it, because it's on a cloud nowadays, that if now they visit to see Mr. Jones at three o'clock in the afternoon has been canceled, well, then, then that can be deleted. And then somebody who's managing the loan worker will realize they're not going there. Actually, they're coming back to the office or actually they're going home and they're going to work from home. So at least we know. The cloud system, I think, is a really good way forward. I'm really pleased to support that. Staff are given, they're given phones nowadays. In my old days, blimey, I had a burner phone. I had all... ABCs, you have to press three times to get to see and all that sort of thing, but we've got more sophisticated phone system, which is great. And these are used now for uh, uh, other things, which we look at sort of communication devices. But for some organizations, they're using radios. And where signals are so poor for their loan workers, the possibility of using satellite phones is a really good feature nowadays. So we've got ability to communicate. Under the Health and Safety at Work Act, it says that there should be regular communication with our loan workers. Loan workers are at an, increased, an increased risk. Trips, slips and falls, encountering violence and aggression in certain situations and circumstances. I, I, I hear time and time again, and even from social workers, that they've set up, the staff themselves have set up their own WhatsApp group. That's not a good idea. Why I say it's not a good idea is, with regard to employee policies and procedures, these should be instrument, these should be conducted and implemented from the top down. It's not for staff to think, you know, I don't feel safe. Um, should we set up our own little WhatsApp group so that when I go in to see this person, I'll let you know and, and then you let me and, and then I'll let you know when I've come out. Is that okay? It's not a good idea. This came up when I did some training for social workers some time ago. I work with the Care Wales organization who regulate care workers across the board. It seemed that it was a situation where a social worker gave one of their when, when their service users the use of their phone to borrow to make a phone call. The person tried to ring the benefits agency. See, they couldn't get through, and then started being nosy. They went into the WhatsApp group. They realised that this person was chatting about them, not only them, about other people. It was a breach of data protection. The member staff lost their job. They'd been using WhatsApp as a cosy chat and joke, but a lone working system it was introduced from the bottom down. That's not right. I discouraged that. 
want to chat, chat, but nothing to do with the workplace. It needs to be regulated. And regarding lone workers, lone workers. I, I hear so many organizations where they have a lone worker policy that, that yeah, we'll have a buddy, but the buddy is somebody who's doing exactly the same job as them. I mean, all honesty, staff are really busy. If I'm in danger and I, and I contact my buddy, well, my buddy may have turned the phone off because they're in a be meeting or whatever themselves. And that's not a good system. And I do highly commend with regard to emerging procedures that we increase the safety of our staff. That we, for example, we've got a record of the current vehicle, the vehicle, car, registration number, make a model, their home telephone number, their mobile number, any medical information. So we got that. But if we're going to use some form of communication device, then we share it. There are so many organizations who have code words and pretty much they're not secret. Pretty much all of them are using that secret code word. Oh, I'm, I'm mis with Mr. Edwards, yeah. Uh, can you have a look in his red folder, please? The Times organizations are all using this so-called secret folder, the red folder, forget it. <laughs> if you're somebody who's aggressive and as a very result, you're dealing with various agencies for support, they're gonna hear that when they know that. It's no longer a secret. So I do like the, the, the thought that organizations are going down this route. I like that. But many, many staff are afraid to use it. They really are. They tell me time again, I don't know, you know, I don't often use it. It's not being supervised. They don't know when to use it, under what circumstances. And I tell them on training, you, you'll never get told off for using it too much. You go into a situation, as soon as you go into some of these sources, you've been ages, I'll tell you what, I tell, the, the hassle I've had waiting for you lot to turn up, and I tell a member of staff, you should be activating that SOS at that time. At least now, somebody in that ARC monitoring center is listening in, is recording, and potentially escalating it if things actually get worse. So, yeah, these are really good for a number of reasons. I might bring, I might come back to that. Okay, some other things. ICE, always encourage staff to set up ICE in case of emergency on their phones. Okay, so in, in danger, if they were unwell, if they uh, trip, slips, falls unconscious, it just means that any member of the ambulance authority can then come up, they try to turn their phone on and uh, they realize then it's on emergency, they can't get through, they click on that, medical emergency, information is all there, or they ring somebody and there we are. We've got that system. Not only that, that's ice for us. That, it was great today, the staff on this course today, they, they're our organization allocated iPhones. And I tell staff with iPhones that you can actually, if you simply, let me just show you firstly, if you with an iPhone press the on off button five times, one, two, three, four, five, it will ring the police if you set it. And in order to set that, all you simply do is go into the settings app and, and click on emergency SOS and then activate auto call and countdown sound, it will do it. And if I, if I was delivering this in person, I'd put the microphone on it and I'd actually do it. I'd apologize afterwards to the emergency services just to show how that, if that can be done. But if we, haven't, if we haven't got an iPhone, if it's an Android, Samsung, Galaxy phone, well then with these, it I don't know why, but you, can, you can't ring the police direct, but all you can do is send a message to your next of kin, your ICE contacts. There may be also an expense to this, which I find frustrating too. But because what it'll also do is send a map of where you are, a photograph of the front and rear screen of the camera system on that phone, depending on the model. And also if you set it, a five second recording of what was actually taking place immediately before that incident occurred. And that's on an Android Samsung phone if your phone is up to date and is allowed to do that. But, but you need to check with your supplier. To sell and I then tell staff about, about please, and I think as more as known about this, the better. Please register your phone to send a text message in an emergency. And I say, what, what do you mean? What's that? I've never heard of it. So for anybody out there now who's watching this, if you haven't registered your phone, you can do so very, very easily. And what I'd like you to do is unlock your phone, open it up, go into your normal text messaging app and click new, and you're gonna send a new text to the 999 services to register your phone. 
you click new and you put the telephone number 999. And then you go down into the content area, the box there, and you type the word register. And when you send that, in about 10 or 15 seconds, you get a text message back. And it says, do you wish to register this phone to send text messages emergency, yes or no? Yeah, I like that. I'll type yes and send it. You get another confirmation text back saying, we now confirm that this phone is registered to send text messages emergency. I tell staff do that. In one recent example, a lady was in a property. The person got aggressive. Get your manager now, he said to her. She said, He's in a meet she's in a meeting. I'll text her. She didn't text the manager. She texted 999. She put 999. She put her location. She said she was being trapped, held against the will. She pressed send. And 10 minutes later, there wasn't a manager turned up. It was the police knocking on the door, sending a text message in an emergency. The more the story about that, the better. Please have a go at it. And uh, if, uh, if that works for you, um, yeah, tell your family. I really like the free, what three words up. I think this is superb because in my policing days, when people rang up this and they tried to describe where they were, they didn't have a clue. This is something I often heard. 999, where's the emergency? Oh, hang on. Let me just make sure I've got some sound for you. I have got sound. Let me carry on. Excuse me. 999, where's the emergency? Um, I don't know where I am. I'm in a clearing in the forest. I didn't recognise anything. Turn left after the big oak tree. I'm on the side of the A1. We get directions like these every day, which is hard when every second counts. What three words has divided the world into three metre squares and given each one a unique three word address? So it's easy to say exactly where you are. Use what three words to help us find you. Something else I share on our little wiki courses. Traveling to, what means a tra transport? Is it on a bus, on a train? Is it driving? And when I talk about on a trains, and suddenly I'm just gonna change my view slightly, so it might look a bit weird, but if I go into main view, this is what I find really amazing, ladies and gents, using Zoom for, in for this virtual learning, that I actually put myself for example, in the London Underground, I'm on that train itself. Well, making my way there. And now I'm going to arrive at the platform. I'm now waiting. So I can now talk about personal safety in this environment. You can also be on a train. Okay. So, so with regard to walking to different locations, about any risks that that person may encounter, I'm actually walking through and past. And we talk about eye contact, whether you avoid it or not. And if you're walking through subways, all these are really useful in bringing learning alive. And they work really, really well. And I'll come back to that shortly. Let me just go back into the slide. Okay, so traveling, public transport, driving, road rage, and what to do, and parking, and where to park, and use of mobiles, and walking, and safety out and about on your own, and knocking on somebody's door, and with COVID nowadays, and the types of properties going into those locations, using PPE accordingly, making your way. Some of the properties my clients go into are not the best, they're not the saviest, flats and things like that, and knocking on doors. Sometimes knocking on doors, in our sessions, we cover, we cover this. <laughs> and what you do. And you won't see that dog, it'll be jumping, it'll all be scratched, and that member of staff is going in there. So we look at safety going into people's homes. And these little fellas <laughs> were very keen, not so much, they're not probably going to bite you when you go in, it's when you leave, that's the problem. So look about dog safety awareness. And what if that person answered the door and they're inappropriately dressed? Because there's another risk of sexual allegations and all that type of thing. And going into properties. And if I can, um, if I may, I'm just going to, I'm just gonna sort of give you some idea of again, how I use virtual backgrounds to convey this area. And this, I find the feedback from this and virtual deliveries is, is incredible. I'm now a member of staff going into somebody's home, a stranger, and what am I seeing? There's light there. What's the environment like? It's full of cigarettes for it. I'm not a smoker, I got asthma. Is that a problem? It is for me. I go into that room and I see, oh, blimey, there's a baseball bat there. I'm worried, I'm concerned. I get invited to sit down. Do I want to sit down? Blimey, look at the state. I don't want to sit down here. What if there's needles between the seats and the chairs? Okay, it's not so bad. I'm going to sit down. But I'm not going to sit by the window because if I do, I'm now furthest from the door. I need to think where I need to sit. 
And look at the environment. What am I picking up? Is there somebody else living here? Why is that? Where's there three cushions on the floor? And what if I get offered a cup of tea? Can I, can I get you a cup of tea? Yeah, is that all right? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and what if it's a member of staff who has to support the individuals who are hoarding? Where do they stand? How do they engage? What safeguarding response is? And what if you're there on your own and suddenly this lot turn up? And then how I use role play in training to go, are you darling? What are you here for then? Huh? Huh? What's going on? Why are you here then? What are you seeing, John? He's my mate. Huh? And to use role play is incredibly powerful during presentations. So it all helps to that learning experience to deal with managing risks, managing risks, risks. And these are some of the risks that come up and are mentioned right at the start of the training day. And those support staff who sometimes in many cases sleep in the project overnight again on their own and the types of risks that they can reasonably encounter. Medical related issues, drunkenness, drug related overdoses, staff on their own with, with individuals and the fear of allegations and trauma and anxiety and, and tantrums and, and individuals banging their heads on the doors and a member of staff trying to intervene and deal with this level of violence and unpredictability factors and drugs related issues and people climbing into their projects and regularly the police turning up. Fights, fight situation. What do I do as a member of staff? Do I go in there and separate them or not? We look at that on training. And how do I deal with self-harm situations? All these issues came up on today's training session. They were very real for the organization I was working with. And then when we talk about how we manage conflict in terms of our actions, our behaviors, all these come out. They're really, really helpful in bringing that subject alive. I talk them through post-incident, the law regarding self-defense. If they feel in danger, what, what can they do within the law to protect themselves. And importantly, when an incident has occurred, in compliance with their employee duties to report the incidents of abuse, threats, and assaults, how do they accurately, robustly report an incident? That's how the course finishes. Ladies and gents, thank you for your time. I hope that was impacting, a bit of fun for you. Uh, my images, the way I deliver this sort of thing, hope that was really useful. A subject where we talk about employers' responsibilities to manage risk, the risk of violence <coughs> and aggression. 2,000 incidents a day, and they're only the ones that are reported. Our employee duties and responsibilities to report and the various risks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vince, that was great. Covered a lot of ground there. And um, yeah, very uh, inspiring presentation. We've not had one use, utilizing those uh, Zoom features, so first time for everything. Thanks very much for that. <coughs> I've been collecting some, <coughs> excuse me, um, some questions as I've been going along. Um, uh, one of the attendees, um, uh, Patrick, has had um, quite a few uh, questions about, uh, I think if I try and put it in a nutshell, which I can't really, because there's a lot going on with what he's saying. Um, I think uh, if you go into an environment um, and Patrick refers specifically to construction and they've got ingrained abuse. So you've got abuse from tier one contractors, drivers, managers, even bullying people, being aggressive towards different strata of workers. You know, they might be the um, tier one, tier two, uh, electricians, plumbers, whatever, and everyone's on a tight schedule. And um, how, how do you respond in an environment like that where you need the work? That's why you're there. Um, you need the money, obviously. <laughs> But you go into that environment and suddenly it's in your face that people are pointing in the face, maybe even assaulting you, but it's ingrained in the culture. So when you're quite shocked about someone putting their hand on you, um, everyone else is like, what's up with you? What's the problem? How do you deal with that? And how do you start to change a culture? Do you just walk away and try and find another profession? Or, or what do you do when, when there's a culture that's not supporting a fair and equitable working environment? Okay, and that is a very, very fair question and sadly a, a real situation for employees today. Employees feeling bullied or intimidated, picked on, physically attacked. It does happen. I'm very much aware of that. Does that get reported? Probably not. And it all starts with the culture and it all starts with the senior management of that organization. The culture has got to be right. Those staff members got to know and have respect. And we've got to have a dignity and respect policy for one another based on all our differences. And that has to be articulated to staff. 
Um, we can't have a fingers crossed approach or they'll all get on this, it'll be fine. We've got, we've got to take disciplinary action, whether that be verbal, ver uh, verbal warnings, written warnings, we take action, which could be disciplinary that people lose their jobs. But the staff themselves have got to have the confidence that the culture shift for them to put pen to paper and they should be supported. Sometimes they can belong to unions, so the union itself can provide that support. The union or the organization to collate or gather evidence if the person feels singled out and nobody's backing them up. It might be that they're given some form of covert mic uh, microphone or recording system. So we've now got evidence to challenge and take those behaviors to task. That is totally unacceptable. It's got to be led from the top down uh, and instruction enforcement introduced. It's a uh, tough it's workplace. Sorry, Vince, just to clarify then, if you want to do something about it, you contact the police because it's a criminal matter. You don't contact the HSE to, to, uh, to whistleblow as such. You, you go to the police because of the criminal nature of what's going on. What, what would you, you would like to think, Tim, is that the organisation should be there to provide not only health and safety, but your welfare. I think a lot of organisations forget the welfare element. How am I being affected by this behaviour? So HR should be taking this to task. But I know and appreciate some of these organisations are very small. You're only looking at a handful of people, perhaps for this particular employer. We, we've got to take a stern line at this. And yes, it is within every individual's opportunity to make a formal complaint to the police with regard to harassment. What is harassment? It's a course of conduct which happens two or more times that makes an individual feel unnecessarily harassed, alarmed or distressed. They get scared of going to work. That could constitute harassment. The police would give you a diary to write down the times and dates and witnesses who were present. And that part forms part of an evidence package in an exhibit that can be given potentially at a later time. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, so it probably doesn't cover everything that Patrick wanted to say, but I, I think uh, he's, he's definitely got a point in that there is in, still in this day and age some ingrained, um, difficult workplace cultures. Um, and it's so hard to, to change that, uh, let alone be a part of it and be affected by it in all the different ways you, you spoke about. Um, also, um, Daisy had a, a question. Um, uh, when what should employers should employers do to protect people from sexual assault um, especially in, in light of the recent um, uh, London uh, murder by a, a Met officer um, allegedly I might add um, but yeah what can employers do to protect members of staff from sexual assault to see it coming to respond to people who feel that they've been sexually assaulted because I know you touched on this uh, sorry bad phrase obviously but um, in the, it's about the context of how someone feels when they're sexually assaulted, not necessarily about the intent of the person or a combination of the two. So uh, it's difficult. So what, what can employers do or should they do to protect people from sexual assault? I think knowing and appreciating the significant media interest at this current time, they should revisit their pol policies on harassment in the workplace, dust them off and then articulate them, put that message out, whether it be they have intranet systems, and they, they, there's certain sort of uh, uh, images or discussions or bullet points. So we've got this soft message in the encouragement for people to come forward. Firstly, the appreciation and understanding of what is in, indeed is a sexual assault. So it might be as a result of some form of education. And this could be done subtly just through messaging or through some form of training. It could be that all staff are encouraged to do an online training package, a half hour package online, answering those questions to have that understanding. But the reality of the organization, that they take that complaint seriously, that they investigate it appropriately and act accordingly based on their findings, Tim. Okay, nice one. And then um, also Daisy, um, brought up an interesting issue. How do you differentiate from banter um, or abuse and bullying? I think with regard to banter and bullying, they're the types of things would will come out in that type of training about harassment and all those things. But fun, well, at whose expense? So I just think you need those clear lines. People get confused. What is it I can say, what I can't say? What is, what is disrespective? Being mindful how we speak. Be mindful of the comments we make. I worked for three years as a hate crime officer with regard to words, behaviors, actions, spitting, damage, graffiti, 
words. Okay, these all have a massive impact on individuals. I think it's an education process. Our organizations need to give these clear messaging to our staff. Yeah. Um, and then um, Lisa Reed had a question about um, road rage assault. Um, she works in the motor trade and some of their drivers um, are victims of, of road rage. Um, how do you approach that in terms of a risk assessment to protect uh, people in your workforce? Oh, um, okay, interesting one there. I looked at the last figures, 2019, there were three and a half thousand incidents reported of road rage where people were assaulted or subject to violence or aggression. What I tell people on courses is, is if they're stuck at the traffic, a set of traffic lights and that person gets out of their car, they see them come in, lock your door, shut your window, sound the horn, bah, draw attention to yourself. Don't get out. I used to train, many years ago, I trained staff who worked for Cardiff Bus. The Cardiff Bus driver is told, if you get out of the bus and you engage and confront a, a, a fellow driver as a result of a dispute around driving, it's going to be investigated, but expect to be disciplined. You could lose your job. I think there needs to be that clarity that you are, when you're acting and operating on behalf of that organization, you are representing your organization. In the past, we saw on the backs of vans, if you're happy with this driver or unhappy, ring this number. And our drivers should realize that when they are representing or even driving from A to B for the organization, it's a circumstance related to their work. So if they suffer abuse, threats or assaults, they need to draw attention, report you accordingly. But the steerage should be that they don't get out because if they do get out, then that could escalate further. And just simply, what I cover on training, stay in the car, you'd be so pleased you did, and just sound the horn and use the horn of the car as a personal attack alarm. Okay, uh, and one of our committee members, Alan Plum, uh, had um, a couple of things, a couple of questions. Uh, you covered one in the, in the what three words. Um, would, would you be able to repeat about the what three words? I think I saw a message um, saying that someone didn't quite get that, and I must admit I didn't either. <laughs> sure. It doesn't really apply because I'm in Sweden, but never mind. <laughs> okay, so what three words is an amazing app. It's free. You can download it on an iPhone, an Android phone. I've got no allegiance to it whatsoever. I just work for lone workers, and I know some. Sometimes those work, loan workers work very remotely. And if an incident happens, a trip slip or fall, and they had to then tell or ring the 999 service to say, yeah, explain where they are. This What Three Words app is brilliant. It doesn't work on 3 or 4G. It works on satellites. So it does a crosshair over where you are. When you're outdoors, they've, what they've done, they've created a mesh that's gone over the entire world, made up of three meter squares. And each square has got its unique code table, lamp, spoon, for example, table dot lamps dot spoon. And it means that the emergency services will then search table, lamp, spoon, and they'll know exactly where you are to the three meter square. So I would encourage people to download it. It's a free app anyway. It doesn't use three or four G. You can use that in the middle of nowhere. And then you could always give your indication of where you are. And going back to what I said earlier, if we have registered our phone to send a text message emergency, when those occasions arise where it says no service, you think, blimey, what am I going to do now? That text message only requires a very small amount of data. Now we could text to the police that three word address. So it helps, it really does help with regard to that too. Yes, it's, it's, it's a good call because um, there are some apps out there that, that charge um for for that sort of response so it's good to have a freebie is it worldwide or just in the UK yeah it, the the grid is everywhere so, so it's like I, gps it uh, is it's just working the satellite systems gps it's the same gps as you use in your car turn left turn right that's what it's using cool and then also Anna mentioned um an interesting one the intimidation of migrant workers um I assume because uh, Alan has a lot to do with rural industries um, in, in uh, agriculture and, and rural industries. And, and how should visitors report this? And it kind of circles back to what Patrick was saying is um, how do you report things that are criminal? Um, so as an auditor, for example, as a health and safety consultant, there's an obligation and indeed part of the charter of IOSH is that I'm, I'm obligated to report something if I see it to the HSE. But this is going a little bit further than that. So how as visitors, should we respond? Should we just uh, clear off and thankfully we don't have to work there and we don't go back or, you know, what do we do to and, help people and to do the right thing? Okay, so when we look at an organisation employing five or more or volunteers or, or workers, in this case, we have a duty of care, the health, safety and welfare. We provide education, we provide instruction, supervision. 
And whether we use translation or we speak to somebody who represents that particular group, if they're all speaking a certain language, what we should be doing to have those conversations that we have, not all people can read, I appreciate that, but we have information to highlight the issues of harassment, bullying, intimidation in the workplace, and the fact that you will be supported. What, whether that is unacceptable behavior, you shouldn't feel frightened or intimidated when you go to work. So it's, a, it's about that dialogue. We have to educate our workers about their own, their rights, their responsibilities. Yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, and also, uh, Maria just gone with a question about social care workers assisting people in everyday life. Um, Maria, would you would you like to have a word? It's a, it's a bit of a long winded one, and I, I don't want to uh, to get it wrong. So I'll, feel free to unmute yourself, or I can unmute you if you want to pose the question verbally. That's Maria Vies. No, okay, I'll pose a question for her then. Um, so uh, we have reports about assaults while supporting someone to go to the pub. What do we do about that? To put it in context, the man touched the leg and she felt as if she had been abused. So social care workers being sexually assaulted, which, which kind of comes back to, um, I think what um, uh, Daisy was saying earlier as well about sexual assault, what to do about it and, and how to handle it as well in the, in the actual situation you're in. Yeah, um, in terms of how to handle it, in terms of advice to, to people who are affected by this, if they are, if there is contact placed on them, they feel embarrassed, upset, offended by it. Well, if there are other people around and, they, and, and we want to draw attention, for example, you saw the train earlier, Sometimes sexual assaults can occur to staff when they're traveling on the underground. And I, I tell staff, right, you say, excuse me, do you mind moving, please? Do you mind moving your hand? Because now we're in a public environment and other people are gonna look, we're naturally drawing attention to ourselves in that environment. We will hopefully never see this person again, but that behavior, that challenge can be quite effective. If we've got the courage to do it, not all people can do it, but if we can, that will help. The response, they move their hand, they move away, they got their head down, God, that's enough for me. What if you know the person? What if that person in a conversation starts getting personal? Well, for me, it needs to be shut down straight away. Look, that's inappropriate. We're not here to talk about me. But the reason I'm speaking to you is about, obviously, the support that we offer and can assist you with. So I think it's an education how staff deflect and, and send it back. And don't start going, well, why is that person now moved closer? Why are they sat next to you? Excuse me. Uh, uh, or, or I would tell, sometimes in training, I'll, I, I want to give staff excuses to leave. The easiest one is to say, look, right, I'm really sorry. I do have to go. I'll make another point. And, and they and, and go if they can. But I remember many years ago, a social worker said that a similar situation happened to her. And what she did, she, she feigned sickness. She suddenly stood up and said, I'm going to be sick. I'm sick. And because she acted and did that, the guy couldn't open the door closer, quick enough for her, and out she went. What are excuses to leave? And, and these are two, there are many more that are brought up during training. What can you do if it gets difficult? Some staff can grab their hand and throw it back. Some are going to freeze. I tell staff, just stand up. If you're going to do anything at all, just stand up and step back. And then I think it's good advice to react rather than just freeze. Um, because if it is a, some kind of predator or a sexual, sexual assault, for you to freeze then almost enables them mm -hmm. to proceed. But at least you know what it is at that point. You either see the shock and horror on someone's face um, or, or the intent, uh, as it were. Um, so, yeah, good advice. Um, so, uh, I think probably that's about it. I think I've covered all the questions. Uh, hopefully I haven't left anyone out. Um, Great presentation, Vince. Um, yeah, it certainly opened up a, a, a lot of things and, and there's some good um, feedback as well with regards to 999 text and uh, um, what three words. So people have taken something away as, as well as got, got people thinking, I think. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Inspiring. Thank you, Tim. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, uh, ladies and gents, for joining us tonight and uh, really appreciate your, your, your attendance here. Thank you. Thanks uh, to Children for your support. Thanks a lot, Vince. Uh, a little bit of clapping in the background there as well. Thanks, guys. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. <laughs>